So when um, Professor Rao asked me uh, to give a talk, you know, on this particular um, conference, I, 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 I thought about, you know, what would be relevant and um, basically decided to go back to our work, you know, that we had done, you know, some time ago. Uh, we had since then, you know, developed quite a bit more comprehensive, uh, complicated models, but um, this particular work really um, is, uh, is interesting in that, you know, it does point out to some of the issues and the characteristics, you know, of, of droughts. They are, uh, you know, they are complicated structure and what to look for, you know, in droughts, especially, you know, since this particular audience, you know, is, de uh, is dealing, you know, with the data issues. So, <clears throat> Basically, I, I will be discussing a simplified general circulation model at mid-latitudes. I'll be only considering uh, the Earth's northern hemisphere just in the band 30 degrees to 50 degrees uh, north band, you know, of, of the northern hemisphere. Um, the reason why, you know, we have this simplified model is to be able to uh, basically do a lot of numerical simulations of the coupled atmospheric hydrologic system by the simplified GCM versus the comprehensive general circulation models where it is difficult to do an ensemble of simulations. In this particular simplified uh, GCM, there are only two atmospheric state variables. One is the atmospheric temperature and the other one is the atmospheric water vapor. The atmospheric, uh, these variables are only intended in the mean values through the depth of the atmosphere over the middle latitudes, specifically in the 30 degrees to 50 degrees band. They are averaged over the depth of the troposphere, basically the lowest 10 kilometer or so, and along the meridional direction. Therefore, the only spatial coordinate left is really the west-east direction denoted by x. The state of the hydrologic system is going to be represented again by two variables. One is the water storage, basically comprised of both the surface and the subsurface uh, water. And the other one is the land surface temperature, T sub G. And then that we are, we are dealing with the coupling of the atmospheric and the Earth's, uh, you know, atmospheric and land hydrologic processes. Uh, such coupling occurs through either the exchange of the thermal energy, radiation sensible and latent heat fluxes, and or and of water, evapotranspiration and rainfall. The whole idea here is to basically, in this particular model, is to qualitatively represent the effects of the ser series of meteorological events in terms of time average climatological quantities. So the first important equation of this model is the first law of thermodynamics, which is the heat transport equation. You see the transport in here. The fundamentally important variable here is the diabetic heating term, which I'm going to come back to later. The solution of this particular uh, transport equation can be actually performed by doing an eigenfunction expansion of the temperature in terms of some n waves, n temperature waves, you know, with amplitudes t sub i and then with the eigenfunctions phi sub i. Uh, the important thing in this eigenfunction is these phases x sub i are represented by the initial location of the wave plus c sub i times t, c sub i being the basically the, the wave speed of the particular wave. That's how these waves are going to be moved basically from the west to the east in the east direction as they are observed climatologically. Similarly, we have an equation describing the atmospheric state, basically atmospheric water vapor transport. Again, a transport which is Again, having a forcing term, a sink source term, uh, evapotranspiration, 
and precipitation. Again, we consider the transport by means of waves. Just take the water vapor content in terms of n waves with amplitudes wi with the eigenfunctions phi i, where you know the phase ci is again represented by the initial location of the wave plus u sub i t, u sub i being the speed of the wave, which is the wind speed. So basically, these uh, the basis functions, the eigenfunctions that we, we saw in the previous slide can be represented by a constant and a half cycle sine wave with varying periods, with, with varying wavelengths, the constant representing the average conditions of the temperature and the water vapor content, whereas the sine waves modeling the weather disturbances. And these wavelengths have a range from 2,000 to 10,000 kilometers. We are dealing with basically a synoptic scale model, a very large scale model. We are looking at continental droughts, basically. So the, the idea is that the temperature and the vapor waves are moved eastward in the mid latitudes, primarily due to the advection by means uh, winds, and just varying by varying the celerities. Now, the important point is that the droughts usually uh, are initiated by some blocking events, such as you know the omega blocks uh, or split uh, waves, uh, like split jet streams. Um, the omega blocks characteristically lead to um, heating of the anomalous heating of the air, which in turn basically can be represented by some very long waves, you know, basically Rossby waves, basically stationary Rossby waves. These waves are basically on the order of about 10,000 kilometers. So we are looking at basically the Rossby waves representing, you know, this initiation of the process. Uh, so basically for temperature waves, assuming a biotropic behavior of the atmosphere, the Rossby wave theory applies for the biotropic conditions and the relationship between the celerities, half wavelengths, can be described again in terms of the Rossby wave, and one can tabulate these you know, relationships uh, in terms of the solution of the Rossby, uh, Rossby equation. And uh, the important thing to note is that the, the, the maximum wavelength is 10,000 kilometers, ranging to about 2,500 kilometers, and then the corresponding you know, speeds. Uh, similarly, the hydrologic water balance, here we are using a very simple hydrologic water balance for the water storage, basically, as a linear storage. You know, you have a recession constant in here, where the recession constant is estimated from the climatological observations, and then you have, again, two forcing terms, evapotranspiration and precipitation. Evapotranspiration is uh, categorized based on whether you know, it's on the oceans or over the land surfaces. Uh, over the ocean surfaces, we have basically the, the, the evaporation described in terms of the water vapor gradient uh, or water content uh, gradient, basically in terms of the mixing ratios, where WWS is the saturation mixing ratio at the water surface and uh, W0 is the actual uh, mixing ratio, and then the, the, the saturation uh, mixing ratio at the surface is described in terms of the ocean temperature. Over the land surfaces, we have a similar expression, where again, the evapotranspiration is expressed in terms of the uh, vapor gradient. Again, we are looking at the mixing ratio on the ground, the saturation mixing ratio on the ground, on the land surface, and then W0 being the uh, mixing ratio at two meters above the ground. Uh, Evapotranspiration is, of course, restricted by the availability of the soil water availability. This is that term, GW being the soil water you know, for a particular grid. We have the sensible heat flux in terms of the temperature gradient. And then, basically, the precipitation. Please note that in the precipitation, we are again, you know, looking at 
basically planetary scale. So we are only looking at supersaturation conditions for precipitation. So fundamentally, this term in here, where we have the mixing ratio, and uh, then we have the saturation mixing ratio. So in order to reach any precipitation, you need to have your mixing ratio basically exceeding the saturation mixing ratio in the atmosphere. The light surface temperature, again, a very, very important component of the whole atmospheric land system. Um, basically, the, the ground temperatures, this, the land surface temperature being basically a balance of uh, the, the incoming and the outgoing fluxes, the net radiation, sensible heat flux, and the latent heat flux. And then uh, here I like to describe the heat and cooling uh, term for the atmospheric thermodynamic equation. That's, that's, as I said, you know, a very, very important component uh, made up of basically short wave radiation absorbed in the atmosphere. Uh, GR being the atmospheric absorption of long wave radiation, basically emitted uh, by the ground surface to the atmosphere. LR is the long wave radiation emitted by the atmosphere to the ground and to the space. HG being the sensible heat flux, L being the latent heat for condensation, and C being the precipitation. So we basically have LC as the latent heat release. So here, I like to just, again, just show in very simple terms as to how, you know, that um, incoming solar radiation, incoming insulation is partitioned in the atmosphere. Uh, part of that is immediately scattered back to space. Then the remaining portion uh, is first, you know, absorbed by the atmosphere. The remaining part is absorbed by the clouds and Part of, part of this is reflected back to space, and the remaining component ends up on the surface. However, for the remaining par part, you know, that ends up in the surface, then it is reflected by albedo back to space. You can, of course, you know, model these in different forms. This is a very simple, uh, you know, modeling effort, basically using the numerical values adopted from Wallace and Hobbes. Harby et al., Eagleson, and so forth. Here we are looking at the long wave radiation balance within the atmosphere. Again, a very, very important uh, energy balance. We see the, basically the long wave radiation that's emitted by the ground surface. You know, the, all this business of you know, global warming, you know, the greenhouse effect. Um, part of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, very much, of course, dependent upon you know, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere. Uh, partly it's absorbed by, by the clouds, and then the rest is lost to the, um, to the space. Whereas, you know, due to the gases, uh, the water vapor, and so on in the atmosphere, there is also long wave radiation that's emitted to the ground as well as to the space. So what we did at this particular study was we said, okay, here we have this model, this very simple uh, GCM. Uh, let's first run this for 300 years to obtain data in terms of monthly averages at 1,000 kilometer grids. Now the, 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 the circumference at this 30 degree to the 50 degree north band is about roughly about 30,000 kilometers. So at 1,000 kilometer grid, you are looking at 30 grids, basically. So that's what we mean by these 1,000 kilometer grids for temperature, mixing ratio, precipitation, etc. Then we compared you know, these values against the observed climatological uh, averages in order to slightly calibrate the simplified GCM to match the observed averages. And here we are looking at basically the, the comparison between you know, the model generated results versus the observations. And we were comforted by the closeness of these results. So how did we start doing our experiments? The first idea was to create the average climatological conditions. In order to do that, basically the simplified GC, uh, GCM simulations start 
from the initial conditions that correspond to the average conditions on some day. We took that day to be 31st December at all of those 30 grid locations, except this Western USA region, but I'll come to that, uh, to that later. First, you know, we are looking at the climatological you know, conditions. So for all those 30 grids, we set up these uh, initial conditions. Basically, um, even though the initial condition for the atmospheric temperature and the water vapor are fixed, we still have the freedom to change, randomly change, the initial locations of those waves. So you can change you know, the initial locations of the waves. That means you know, when you place a wave at a certain grid, then you have a chance of the development of disturbances you know, at that particular grid. It's assumed that you know, once we place a T or a v, uh, W wave at, the, at some region, it's assumed that there's the potential for the growth of one of these waves in that region. Whether the wave will develop or not depends on the state of the system, as we are going to see. So, what must be shown? What must, one, one must show is that, okay, you set up, you know, these initial conditions, and you are randomly changing the initial condition, conditions for these temperature and the water vapor waves. Well, once you start, you know, just simulating, you know, the, the evolving system after those initial conditions, how's that, how does that whole system evolve from starting from that random initial conditions? Now, if it is truly replicating the climatological, you know, average state, the standardized value, which is basically, in this particular case, you know, the water storage minus the observed water storage, mean water storage, divided by the standard deviation of the observed water storage must be zero, okay? So this is the, this is the line that must be simulated. Well, look what happens. If you just take any of these realizations, you can immediately reject the model. You can say, forget this model. I mean, you know, it's, it's going all over the place. However, the interesting thing is, if you take an ensemble average of all these realizations, you suddenly see a much different pattern. So on the ensemble average sense, the model is doing fine. It is moving around that, you know, observed average. So that comforted us. Now, on that climatological you know, system, those initial conditions, what one must do is to basically simulate the effect of an omega block. How are we going to do that? Well, we are going to basically create a heat wave, a heat wave, a stationary heat wave, over that particular grid where that omega block is taking place, okay? And how can one do it? We are taking that to be the Western USA grid. Over the Western USA grid, we superimpose basically a heat wave of amplitude one degree centigrade over the climatological average, okay? For a duration of one month. How, how do we do that? We basically take a stationary Rossby wave of 10,000 kilometer length. So that wave pretty much stays, the, stays constant for a long time, okay? So that is the forcing in the system over you know, the climatological you know, uh, state. That's the only forcing that you are introducing to the system. One month, you are increasing the temperature over the climatological average by one degree over one grid, only one grid. Okay. However, obviously those initial conditions are, are, are you know, are, are random. So those locations are randomly, you know, uh, over all those 30 grids. Okay. So in these figures, while the individual realizations of the GCM simulations of the Earth's nonlinear system look chaotic, as we are going to see, we are going to see some clear trends. So here we go. We are seeing here the plot of basically what happens when you superimpose this particular stationary heat wave 
for only one month, only one month, over the average climatological system. For only one month. So therefore, we just introduce that heat wave for one month, and then after one month, we remove it and let the system evolve. Once you know, the, the heat wave is introduced, we see a, a depletion of the water storage over that 1,000 kilometer grid for nearly 10 months, roughly about 10 months. And then it starts picking up again. Again, the interesting thing here is, please note that you know, the realizations, each realization is anywhere. But when you take the ensemble average, then a very clear pattern basically emerges. That is what is really so interesting. Let us see about the other components that lead to this water depletion. Here we are looking at the precipitation that corresponds to that one month of heat wave forcing. You can see that you have basically non-existent, this is basically non-existent you know, rainfall or very, very little rainfall for nearly about nine to 10 months, no rainfall, okay? And then rainfall eventually, you know, basically reaches its equilibrium conditions. But please note, even if after, you know, the rain reaches its equilibrium conditions, the water depletion is still very, very substantial. How about the other components? This is where, you know, it, it becomes really important to have a perspective that must incorporate hydrology to the whole equation in the Earth's system. Look what happens to the land surface temperature. I'll explain you why, why this is happening. And then look what's going on with the evapotranspiration, again, due to that particular one month of the heat wave. Well, what happens is the following. You put that heat wave in there, you are heating the uh, atmosphere, so the temperature rises. When the temperature rises, the saturation mixing ratio rises. Therefore, you are away from the condensation conditions now, okay? There is no way you are going to get any precipitation, so no precipitation. But because, you know, the, the, the temperature, the air temperature increases, you see a big jump in the land surface temperature initially, initially. But then what happens is that you have increased the temperature, you have therefore increased the saturation vapor uh, content, therefore all that vapor could not condense, so you have increased the vapor content in the atmosphere. When you increase the vapor content in the atmosphere, what happens is that you create cloudiness. The cloud starts increasing. So suddenly you, you, you are getting you know, a lot of clouds, which in turn are going to block the net radiation. So once these clouds form and block the net radiation, you suddenly see a big decrease in the land surface temperature. You see, land surface temperature suddenly falls tremendously. Not only does the land surface temperature fall, but from the land surface energy balance, you can, you can say that since you know net radiation is the real source for the fluxes, the latent heat flux also diminishes tremendously, okay? Because net radiation is suddenly blocked, okay? So if you go to that particular figure, you see also a big decline in the evapotranspiration. Then what happens? Well, the, there are clouds, and these clouds basically are observing the, you know, the, 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 the radiation, the net radiation, so, so the atmosphere is warming further. Therefore, The, the deficit in ra rainfall is continuing, okay? The deficit in rainfall continuing. However, what happens is that once the atmosphere warms up, 
the long wave radiation, the long wave radiation becomes really important. Downward long wave radiation starts heating up the surface, not the short wave radiation, but the long wave radiation, the, the greenhouse effect, okay? The long wave radiation starts heating up. But this is a really interesting situ situation. Still, the atmosphere is warm. The long wave radiation is heating up the surface. So the sensible heat flux suddenly diminishes, almost becomes non-existent because there are no temperature gradients almost, okay? But you've got all that heat, so the land surface temperature starts increasing and aeroplane transpiration starts increasing. So when you look at that part of the graph, you start seeing the land surface temperature increasing and you start seeing the upper transpiration increasing. Eventually what happens is that that heat in the atmosphere is basically released by the emission of all that long wave radiation so the atmosphere starts to cool off. That's one thing. Secondly, the upper transpiration, that local moisture supply starts to raise the mixing ratio further to exceed the saturation mixing ratio, basically creating the rainfall conditions. So you can see that starting about, you know, the, the um, eight month or so, the rain starts increasing as the evapotranspiration increases and the atmosphere starts to cool off. Okay. So you can just go on and on and on. I don't have much time, so, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to the major story. Okay, so eventually things return to equilibrium by all these feedback processes going back and forth, back and forth. But what happens is that we ended up with a depleted soil water storage. You see, the soil water storage is depleted. In order to break this drought in a short time, I mean, in our simulations, you know, what, what we could show, it's, it can be easily shown is, unless you have convergence, so some moisture, major moisture convergence from outside, you are not going to be able to break this drought. What we are showing in here is that if there is no external moisture convergence into this region, what happens? Well, what happens is, please note, on the average, on the ensemble average, it takes about nearly four and a half years for this drought to recover. That's what happens. What is really interesting in this whole thing is the omega block was only for one month. The omega block was only for one month. Well, it created a drought that's nearly for five years. If you don't have any moisture, external moisture conversions, of course, this model is a very simple model, I must say. And uh, we have looked at, you know, uh, increasing in here, uh, we have looked at basically increasing the magnitude of that, you know, heat wave, and then looked at, you know, how that increase in the magnitude of the heat wave affecting the, uh, the depletion. Obviously, it, uh, it does affect, and, you know, also the duration. But again, what's really interesting is look at the, Rainfall. There isn't much difference in the rainfall depletion, the rainfall behavior. So all that, you know, the, the, the soil moisture, you know, depletion and recovery must be, you know, some other to, due to other factors besides the rainfall. That is the important point. Similarly, if you increase the duration of the heat wave, you are, you know, there is again, you know, all this the importance of that nonlinear feedback among different, you know, land and atmospheric components. So in conclusion, from the simulations of the simplified GCM, it's seen in the ensemble average sense that droughts over a region, if defined in terms of combined surface and subsurface water storage in that region, are not only a function of the deficit in precipitation, but may also be due to other geophysical factors, such as atmospheric temperature, humidity, cloudiness, and radiation and ground temperature and aerotranspiration. And these short-term, 
short period anomalous heat wave forcings over a region can produce long lasting drought conditions at the mesoclimatic time scale in the end, ensemble average sense. What is rather important is that, again, on the ensemble average sense, these simulations, basically by the simplified GCM, have shown that the drought conditions are nonlinear in the sense that the drought causing, drought causing mechanisms feed on themselves. There is this, all this feedback process going on. Imposing an anomalous temperature wave over a region for a relatively short time, for about one month, induces geophysical conditions in that region which reduce the precipitation for a much longer period of about one year. And the drought recovery period, in terms of the water uh, storage, being proportional to the peak severity of the drought, can be you know, on the order of years. So another very important point is that realization-wise, just single realization-wise an analysis of droughts may really mean nothing. I am talking about the models, not the observations, okay? I mean, just, just modeling, you know, the drought conditions, say, by a, by a fully comprehensive, you know, GCM for one realization under certain initial conditions may mean nothing. These results must be looked at in the ensemble sense because we are really dealing with a nonlinear system, a nonlinear system with all sorts of uncertainties in it. So therefore, the way we perceive of droughts are they are nonlinear, complicated, complex phenomena that have several components that need to be observed. So as far as you know, the data taking is concerned, not only the precipitation and the atmospheric conditions, but also the land conditions are very important, such as the soil moisture such as the land surface temperature, evapotranspiration. These are all very, very fundamental quantities to observe in order to really come up with a comprehensive picture of the droughts. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Vijay. I'm glad you know you asked this question. The whole plot was actually only for the Western USA grid, which is a 1,000 kilometer grid. It's not a small grid, well, yeah, by any means. I mean, but, then, but we are yeah. observing, uh, we are observing these large scale uh, droughts in many parts of the world, lasting not for six months or one year, but in some cases, for example, in Africa for several years. Yeah, and even though climate change and global warming scenario, the rise in the temperature is only you know, half to one degree. So what you, are, what you are showing or what your model is portraying is not in contradiction with what we are observing. So it's very interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason why I actually decided on making this presentation, we do have models, you know, that uh, basically model the whole globe in terms of basically what's called as quasi-geostrophic uh, theory, which can model you know, these large uh, motions, basically what are called as barotropic motions, quite uh, satisfactorily. Uh, so you can you know, use much more comprehensive models for the motion of the waves, both you know, the temperature and the vapor waves. Uh, and you can look at you know, much smaller regions than you know, this 1,000 kilometer. But the results are quite similar, actually. They are quite similar. Uh, you know, it was mentioned about El Nino and La Nina. Uh, again, these are very probabilistic events. You know, it's not like, you know, uh, 
uh, if you know, there's an El Nino, El Nino event, there are going to be floods. It is not the case, definitely not the case. Even you know, over a region which is basically uh, more perceptive you know, to such, such an event. Only in the probabilistic sense you can really discuss you know, these events, El Nino, La Nina, so on and so forth, and uh, climate change is no different. Thank you.